I'm just sitting here thinking, okay, did I miss something and I'm the only one? <laughs> <laughs> I hear Gary's going back to work. Yeah. Well, of course, now he's been work, other than when he was sick, he's been working ever since March. But yeah, this first time he's been on an airplane since March. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Yeah. Did he leave already? One o'clock. I see. Yeah. He should be yeah. leaving right now. Oh, wow. wow. Well, they had a meeting this morning in the choir room. Yeah, and I we didn't go because we were still getting his bag ready. Yeah, we didn't go. Off. Yeah, because we're going, we're leaving next Sunday for Florida. Oh. Well, but if, if we're still on Zoom, we can do, we can get Zoom in Florida. Okay. I, th I think, unless they said, no, we weren't here last Sunday, so, but unless they changed their minds then, I, I think what we're probably doing is finishing Ruth via Zoom, and then we might start meeting in the classroom, but I don't know if well, that's what everybody Don, decided. Don said, this, Don said this morning that we were going to do like three more weeks. Didn't he say that? Yeah, he said two to three. Jeff's going to do two to three more weeks on Zoom to finish okay. our proof, and then yeah, after and that, they'll Mark decide. Gonna, Mark yeah. will probably take. I over. guess he talked to Mark um, and said that's uh, that's what they were going to do. But yeah, I that's kind of what I think is going to happen um, yeah. because I knew he had talked to Mark, and Mark was willing to, you know, I run with it whenever he needed to. Hey, Jeff. I think he's on. Oh. It always takes him a minute to get yeah right yeah. get going. <laughs> well, we're gonna miss you when you head off to Florida. Well, yeah, we always do. <laughs> I, know. I know you're excited to go because I know you love what you do there. Yeah, we do. We do. It'll be interesting though with all the yeah. All so the it might be a little different. Florida's pretty <laughs> not though. So yeah, we'll see. Yeah. When do you leave? Next Sunday. Oh. Yeah. Where are y'all going? Florida. Up to Florida for the winter. <laughs> Time to go to Florida, huh? It's getting cold up here. No. All right, sure. Well, we expect that out of the Brickells. <laughs> Those transit people. Yep. Heading to Florida so they can vote down there, I guess, huh? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, how's everybody doing today? Good. We're doing okay. Enjoying a little cooler weather, are you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I like the fall. I do, too. Next to spring, it's my favorite. Yeah. I always say, you know, where I grew up in Mississippi, they've only got two fall colors, green and brown. <laughs> I can relate. I mean, from East Texas, that's kind of what it is. <laughs> but up here, you get all kinds of colors, which I enjoy much more than green and brown. Yeah, me too. And if you went up north, you'd have more colors. Yeah. Yes. It's true. Mm -hmm. it's I've never been up to the to see the leaves up in New Hampshire or any, anywhere of those places up in the in the far northeast, but they say it's really beautiful. It is. Well, it right doesn't compare to here. No. Now this time of year, it could be all over up there. It depends on how yeah. cool it gets. The Adirondacks yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah, we've been up there in the Adirondack Mountains in New York State in 1st of October, and there was no leaf on the trees. Wow. wow. The weather. It just depends on the weather. That's right. Sure. Well, it's good to see everybody today. Uh, Janie, how was your you and Gary's trip last week? It was very good. It was it was very relaxing and just a nice time of visiting with Brian and Brittany. So it was very good. And good. I took him on an airplane today to fly to Mississippi. His plane should be taken off just about now. Wow. Yeah. So he's now, is he going work? down to do some work this week? 
Yeah, so he's he's starting to be back on the road again. On the road again. That's the on first the time in a while. First time since March, so it <laughs> not very much activity at the airport, I can tell you that. No. I would so. Brian and Brittany are well? They are well. And so let's see, two weeks away we'll be we'll be headed back up to the second wedding. <laughs> Oh, the second wedding. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the second wedding. <laughs> I forgot about that. I know you're really hoping this comes to an end before you have a daughter getting married, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got a little ways to go, I think. Yeah, I think you do, too. Uh -huh. Unless somebody's got a surprise up her sleeve or something. <laughs> I don't believe so. Hannah can't, she wouldn't be able to keep something like that from me. She'd be telling me. <laughs> All right, well, let's go ahead and get started with prayer. Let me mention a couple items at the beginning, and then if you have some concerns. Uh, we had almost a double amount of COVID cases at North Greenville this week. Ooh, wow. So we were concerned about a bit of a spike. We had had 34 cases since August 10th, last Friday, a week ago. Uh, this Thursday night, we had added 27 active cases for a total of 61 now. So we're trying to contain that as, as much as possible. We don't want to see a, a major outbreak there. So I'd make that our first prayer request today. If you'll pray for God's grace to us at North Greenville that we could get this uh, under control, get people uh, where they need to be. We've put some, some stricter protocols in place through, um, I guess, next, next Sunday um, for, this, for this week. It, 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 they can continue if needed, but at least for this week. So uh, please remember us, North Greenville. And then I, I would mention a friend of mine. I haven't heard an update on him, but I do want to keep him in our prayers. My friend from college, Chris King, that's got multiple myeloma. Uh, the last update I'd heard, you know, he had experienced paralysis in his legs because of um, uh, compression fracture in his back, weakened bones there from the cancer. So uh, I haven't mentioned him in a couple of weeks. I haven't heard a report, but I do want to continue to pray for Chris and ask for God's strength to him. Uh, other concerns today? Other prayer requests, maybe words of praise? There's Peggy in the hospital. There's Peggy in the hospital. Hi, Peggy. Hey, Peggy. Hey, how are y'all? Good. Better than you. Well, You're there she better is. Than me. <laughs> I heard you have uh, pancreatitis and uh, attack of gallstones. I do, and I have to get over the pancreatitis before they'll do the surgery for the gallstones. Yeah. So I've got. Well, I'm glad to see you, but I wasn't expecting to see you in the in the hospital bed for Sunday school. <laughs> uh, well, I just like. Had nothing else to do. I'd rather listen to y'all. Hey. Now, you know you're going to become an illustration in one of my classes. I'm going to say, you know, one time when I was teaching Sunday school, one of my students was so dedicated to the study that she zoomed in from the hospital bed. <laughs> Modern technology. Yeah. Frank had that same thing. All right. and he well, let's pray for Peggy for sure. Well, what was that? I'm sorry, Beth. <clears throat> Frank had the same thing <clears throat> as Peggy, and he was in the hospital for a week, <clears throat> came home trim as anything because he couldn't eat anything, <clears throat> and he lost his gallstone. So keep up, keep your chin up there, Peggy. Oh, I will. <laughs> this, this is the third time I've had pancreatitis, so I'm ready to get rid of it. Well, I'm, I'm sure ready. You are. But what he told me today was uh, when the pancreatitis gets healed, they'll take the gallstones out the next oh, day, yeah. gallbladder out rather the next day. Yeah, mm. that's what he mm. did. Yeah. Then I'd have six weeks of no heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. mm. Goodness. I'll be mom. Well, let's pray for, pray for Peggy as she's not feeling well, but she's a dedicated Sunday school member, and she's here, and she's got uh, some surgery up. Coming up as soon as I get the pancreatitis under control. So, That's it. anyone else? Maudine is in the hospital. Maudine. Maudine. Okay. Do Do we know what she's dealing with? 
I'm trying to look. I saw it on Facebook. Pneumonia is what it said. That's oh no. Yeah. All right. Let's remember Maudine. She's got pneumonia. Uh, it's not a good thing for sure. All right. Others today. Our president. Yes. Yeah, totally. yeah, President and the First Lady obviously diagnosed with the virus and several others in his uh, immediate circle. So uh, let's pray for, you know, that's going to have some implications. Uh, last month of the, of the presidential race, I uh, hate to see him incapacitated on the front end of that. So yeah. let's pray that he'll recover quickly and be able to get back to what he needs to do uh, in in trying to win re-election. Any, uh, Yvette, you look like you were about to share one with us. Have you got one? Yes, I am having eye surgery tomorrow, um, cataracts and glaucoma. So I don't, I know cataracts is kind of, eh, but I don't know what the double dose thing is. So anyway, I covet your prayers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pray for Yvette. She's got uh, some issues with her eyesight and they're going to be doing some procedures there so let's just pray that uh, god will guide that situation to bring uh full healing and restoration to her vision anyone else yes i do um susan and and my gary's um other sister that lives in kentucky they decided that they're planning to make a move down here to greenville with their mom um mm -hmm mainly because her dementia seems to be progressing and they just see that it would be better to be close to all, all four siblings. Um, okay. So tomorrow is moving day. It's all happened really fast. And wow. so, um, that's a big transition, big transition for mom. Just pray that she would be find peace and contentment in that transition. And for Gail and Ronnie, I feel like they're putting, you know, a lot of things of their own aside in order to do this. And um, mm. so wow. we don't really know how it will all look, but just pray for them as they make that move down this way. Certainly. Well, that that's, that is a, a, a development that I wasn't expecting for sure that quickly. We so. weren't either. <laughs> and in truth, uh, for, for Gary's sister, Gail, that Gail and Ronnie, when they decide something, they just, whoop, they just do it really fast. Um, so yeah, none of us knew this was happening until about three or four weeks ago. So, um, gotcha. so we're just hopeful that it all works out well. All right, let's pray for Gary and Susan's mother and then Sister Gail as they're moving down to the Greenville area. And uh, let's also pray that, uh, you know, I know someone struggling with dementia, confusion is uh, an issue. And so we pray that this move won't contribute to further confusion for her exactly. uh, as she adjusts to the new situation. All right, anyone else? Continue remembering Tony, our son-in-law, uh, still looking for a job. Okay, as Tony's uh, in need of, of a job, so let's pray. Uh, how about Bryce? Did he start into the, uh, the program there? Yeah, started in. They're doing a really good job from the things he's telling us as far as uh, protecting. You know, they're trying to do all the things. I'm sure that you all are doing it, North Greenville and stuff. So right. they're they're um, so so far so good. Okay, good. Uh, let's also pray for for our church as we're, uh, and, I'm, and I assume today that uh, Sunday schools met for the first time in classrooms uh, in quite some time. Uh, of course, our class is, is possibly going to finish up our material today. And I talked with Mark uh, about class, and, and he's going to be there uh, starting. Well, actually, I think he, he, he showed up today for anyone who uh, would come, and he's going to be taking over the class when we finish. So, uh, let's pray for that transition back into Sunday school. We're, we're opening up a lot of things at the church and certainly don't want to see another outbreak of the virus there. So uh, let's pray for all the, the transitions there that are going on. All right, anything else before we pray? Well, let's join together for prayer. 
Father, we give you thanks for this day, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity we have to study together as we come to the end of Ruth, Lord. Pray that you'll guide us in, in completing this study. Uh, Lord, if it perhaps would be today or, or whether it would be another week, but Lord, uh, either way, God, I pray that we will see your hand at work in our lives the same ways that we see your hand at work in, in Ruth and Naomi's lives, Lord, and Boaz's life and the life of uh, of your people, God, as we conclude the study today. We know that, Lord, the, the, the work that Boaz did in redeeming Ruth and, uh, and providing an heir to carry on the name of Elimelech and his sons, uh, Lord, it ended up being an even greater blessing than he could have imagined. And so, Lord, I, I thank you that when we look at our lives and, God, we see the struggles that we face sometimes, Lord, we're, we're just not sure, uh, God, how you're going to work those things out for good. Sometimes from our perspective, it looks impossible for good to come out of those situations. But, Lord, we thank you, as your word tells us, that you have a blessing in store for us that we can't even imagine, uh, Lord, that we couldn't even think to ask you for. And so as we see that conclusion today in Ruth, uh, Lord, I pray it would encourage us, Lord. We're, we're not sure how this all plays out with the coronavirus pandemic. We're not sure what happens with the presidential election. Uh, Lord, there's so many uncertainties right now. But, Lord, we do know that, God, you have a good plan. And, Lord, you're going to bless us in ways that we can't even begin to articulate today. So we're going to go ahead by faith and praise you before we see how you work it out, trusting you and knowing, God, that you're going to bring, Lord, a blessing to us, and so we pray that you will. Now, God, we lift up these concerns today. Uh, in each case, we pray your presence be felt and your will be done. We realize there are some unspoken needs we've not been able to share openly. Uh, God, we just pray that in each case, Lord, uh, we would see your hand at work and give you praise. Lord, we ask you to be with Gary as he's traveling down to Mississippi and resuming uh, a part of his work that uh, has certainly been uh, difficulty in the past, Lord, him being out on the road. We just pray that you'll keep him safe, Lord. Keep him uh, healthy, God. Give him strength. We know he's still recovering his full strength from the virus, so we just pray that you'll uh, be merciful to him and help him, Lord. Uh, God, we do pray and lift up Peggy today. Lord, thank you that she's uh, able to join us through uh, these amazing technologies of Zoom, Lord, but we also know she's not feeling well and Lord, she's got two conditions that are interrelated. She needs the pancreatitis to, to be healed so that she can have uh, the ne necessary procedure for her gallstones. And so, Lord, we're just asking that you'll put your hand of healing on and protection on her, Lord. Uh, help her to be able, uh, God, to heal quickly and then be able to have the procedure and be able to be restored fully, Lord. Just pray you put your hand of, of healing on her now, God. Lord, we pray for the Brickells. We know they're getting ready to go down to Florida, Lord. So we just pray that you'll bless them as, as they make that transition. And, and, Lord, that everything will go well for them. Uh, God, we pray and lift up Yvette as she's dealing with uh, this eye situation, Lord, as the doctors are going in. And, uh, Lord, just pray you take away any anxiety or uncertainty that she has, Lord. Just give her a sense of your peace and strength, Lord. And God, we pray for the Holman family, Lord. We pray for Gail and Ronnie and and, Lord, for uh, their mother, God, as uh, this uh, rather rapid transition is taking place tomorrow, moving down to the Greenville area, uh, just ask, God, that you'd be with them and encourage them and, and help them through the changes, Lord, especially their mother, that she'd not be confused uh, as a result of the change in her environment and surroundings. Uh, God, we do pray for Tony. He still is looking for a job. We pray you'd open up the right doors for him. Thank you in Bryce's situation, Lord, that he was able to begin classes and just ask you to continue to put your hand on his school and, and Lord, protect them from uh, an outbreak of the virus, Lord. Uh, we continue to pray, Lord, and ask you to be with North Greenville. Uh, even though we had a spike in cases this past week, almost double, uh, Lord, just asking that you'll help us as we tighten the protocols to be able to maintain uh, Lord, some, some order and control, and the virus would not spread and, and cause great difficulty for the completion of our semester. Lord, I want to pray for my friend Chris King as he continues to struggle with multiple myeloma, Lord. I know that uh, he, he's been in a very difficult situation with the paralysis resulting from the uh, compression fracture in his spine. I just pray that you'll be with him, with his wife, Joy, Lord, help little Arthur, uh, God, who's growing up and Lord, I'm just praying for your mercy to Chris that he'll be able to survive and, 
and Lord, to return to health so that he may be able to be the father he wants to be to his son. And so, God, we just ask you to touch him right now. Lord, we do pray and, and lift up other concerns. God, several issues that have been mentioned. Perhaps I've forgotten one today. Uh, Lord, we pray for a clear view as we're opening back up the different facets of our uh, church services, Lord, uh, with Sunday school and uh, back on campus and, and Lord, with Sunday night services and choir involvement in services. Lord, all these things, we're just praying that you'll keep us from any major outbreak of the virus that would cause us to have to step back. Lord, we continue to lift up our nation in light of the divisions that we are experiencing, God. Uh, we, we just continue to look to you for strength and wisdom. And now, Lord, we pray you guide our class. Uh, your spirit would be present and active today. And, Lord, you'll apply these texts to our lives in ways that, God, will, will help us to have that great hope, Lord, uh, of your continuing presence and power, Lord. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you will, turn with me to Ruth chapter 4. And I am going to make an effort to finish up today. I think that we can do that. And I think in the end it will probably be the easiest transition for everyone now that the classes are uh, meeting back on Clearview campus. Uh, let me just say that it has been my privilege to teach you via Zoom when I normally would not have been able to do that because of my interim. So uh, praise God. He, he's already brought something good out of what looked like nothing good could come. We've been able to work through the book of James and the book, the book of Ruth together, and uh, we wouldn't have had that opportunity. And so I'm thankful uh, for the opportunity to teach you those, those books in this time of uncertainty. And I pray that both of them have been, have been an encouragement to you. I uh, have helped you to remember that uh, when we go through trials, God is using those for our good to grow our faith and help us to become more the people he wants us to be. And then the incredible story of Ruth, how God is, is working behind the scenes in every area of our lives in ways that we can't really even see. And he's always working those things to our benefit. And we'll see that conclusion today in Ruth chapter 4. And so remember last time we were at the gate and Boaz had gone to represent Ruth and Naomi there. Uh, he had put together a council of ten elders. He had brought the closest of kin uh, there into the gate, and he had presented his case, which I think he presented in a persuasive way. Uh, he only speaks of the piece of land to begin with, but then once the Goel, or the closest of kin, agrees to take that land, to purchase it, to redeem it, uh, then he says, oh, by the way, if you're going to redeem the land, you've also got to take Ruth. Uh, as your wife, and you've got to provide a male heir to carry on the family. Of course, at that point, the Goel sadly realizes it's going to cost him more than he thought to get involved with this situation. And I think to Boaz's delight, he now says, I'm not going to be able to redeem the land. You take the right of redemption. Uh, I think that's the, that was Boaz's plan all along. And so he is able to, to work through this in a very uh, strategic way. And so now they go through a ritual, uh, a little different ritual than Numbers 20, excuse me, than De Deuteronomy 25 prescribes. Uh, in this case, because the widow is not present, uh, there's not the removing of the sandal of the one who refuses to do his, uh, his uh, responsibilities, um, and she spits in his face. In this case, since Boaz is there, and probably because Ruth is a Moabite, uh, doesn't have legal standing, uh, in this case, a slightly different ritual, the removing of the sandal, which may, in fact, indicate the possession of the land in light of the ancient custom of walking uh, through a land or walking its boundaries to claim it as one's own piece of property. So by exchanging the sandal, he is now uh, giving the land and along with it the right of redemption for Ruth and the responsibility of the Leveret marriage to Boaz. And then remember, those who were jointly gathered as witnesses at the gate are going to enter into this formal kind of conclusion uh, to the legal matter by uh, saying that they're witnesses and then pronouncing blessings uh, on Boaz and Ruth. And particularly, they bless Ruth to become like Leah and Rachel, the wives of Jacob who built the nation of Israel, and to be like Tamar, which is a quite interesting connection back to Genesis chapter 38 that we had seen earlier where we have that sort of leverage situation as well. Uh, remembering Tamar as a Canaanite woman, Ruth as a Moabite, uh, now being brought into the family line of Abraham, 
and carrying on the blessings that God promised in his covenant. And so those blessings then kind of set us up for this final scene. And so I want to pick up now in chapter 4 and reading in verse 13. And I'll go ahead and read all the way to the end of the chapter, anticipating that we should be able to finish up uh, all the way through the chapter today. So beginning in Ruth 4.13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went in to her. And the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord, who has not left you without a Redeemer today, and may his name become famous in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and is better to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. The neighbor women gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Oved. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Hmm. Now these are the generations of Perez. To Perez was born Hezron, And to Hezron was born Ram, and to Ram, Abinadab, and to Abinadab was born Nashon, and to Nashon, Salmon, and to Salmon was born Boaz, and to Boaz, Obed, and to Obed was born Jesse, and to Jesse, David. All right, this is a very significant scene, and it really puts a frame on the entire book. And we actually looked at this early on in Ruth because we wanted to be ready for it, and now we're actually here. So let's think through this a little bit. First of all, uh, Boaz is taking Ruth as a wife, so we make it official. Uh, We have probably some type of a wedding ceremony that's not mentioned here, but the wedding is not the main issue. Why is Boaz marrying Uh, Ruth, and that's to provide the male heir to carry on the family name, to redeem the family, uh, and to bring restoration. And so we kind of jump over the marriage and the wedding uh, ceremony. No doubt they followed the Jewish custom of having a week uh, of celebrations, uh, a very public type of wedding there, certainly a joyous occasion. But the author wants to get right to the point, which is that Boaz consummates the relationship with her sexually and the Lord enables her to conceive, and she bears a son. And so we see exactly what uh, this whole situation was uh, set up to do in light of God's intervention here for these widows. Now the family problem has been resolved. Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, uh, has been able to provide by the hand of God a son to carry on Elimelech, uh, his name, as well as the names of his sons. And so this is a a very joyous moment, but it's right here that we encounter something from the beginning of the book, and we have to think back a little bit. So somebody help me out. In verse 14, what's significant about who appears here with words of blessing for Naomi? Women. Women. (laughs) Okay, the women. Why is that significant? They greeted her when she came back and said, is this really Naomi? Absolutely. So let's turn back to chapter one real quick, because this is the frame on the book. And in chapter one, verse 19, so they, being Naomi and Ruth, both went until they came to Bethlehem or Beit Lechem, the house of bread, And when they had come to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred because of them, and the women said, is this Naomi? Now, what Naomi says in response is quite significant to the book as a whole. What's she say? I don't want to be called Naomi. What does her name mean we said earlier? Bitter. Pleasant one. All right. It meant to start the pleasant one or the beautiful one. I don't want to be called pleasant anymore. What do I want to be called now? Mara, which means bitter. And then she gives us that programmatic statement that really pretty much shapes the entire story of Ruth. She says, the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. I went out full, 
and the Lord brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi, seeing that the Lord, his hand has gone out against me? All right, so the women come in, they see her, she responds to them. Now, here's what we've been tracing out. What has God been doing in light of that idea that she went out full and now she's come back empty? What's God been doing throughout the book? He's been refilling her, right? Uh, he leads Ruth into the field of Boaz. Ruth meets Boaz. Boaz just treats her with an incredible uh, example of kindness and compassion. Uh, he calls her in to eat with his workers. He puts her in charge, uh, in the charge of his maidens to, to work in the fields. He gives her more food than she can eat. He lets her drink out of the, uh, out of the water that his servants are drinking from. Uh, he tells his servants, bring uh, more of the, uh, of the harvest, drop it intentionally on the ground so that Ruth can pick it up, let her go wherever she wants to go to get uh, as much as she can gather. She goes home with 50 pounds of grain uh, and the leftovers from her lunch and gives to Naomi. Uh, she goes and stays with the maidens throughout the, the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. When she comes to the threshing floor, uh, Boaz takes care of her. He protects her reputation. He says, hey, look, uh, take some these six measures of grain back with you to your mother-in-law. Don't want you going back empty-handed. So that whole idea, just over and over again, the idea of refilling. But now, in chapter 4, when the women speak, the author is wanting us to go back to chapter 1 when they spoke before, and when they ask, is this really Naomi, and, and, and that statement of theme was given, uh, what has happened now? Well, let's look at what the women say, because it's actually a direct connection to what Naomi said back in chapter 1, in verse 21. Uh, so back in 4 now, verse 14, the women said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a Redeemer today, and may his name become famous in Israel. Let's stop with just that verse. Uh, let's, we're, we're praising God here because Naomi said, I went out full and I came back empty. And now the women say, blessed is the Lord. He's not left you without a redeemer. Now, it doesn't use the words, but what essentially are they saying in light of what's happened? You've been saved. You are full again, mm -hmm. is what they're saying. The Redeemer that God has brought to you has now brought you the fullness that you had lost. You, you've come full circle. You've come back now because th there's a, a Redeemer. And look what v verse 15 says. Uh, May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. And this is an incredible statement about Ruth right here. I don't want you to miss this. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is better to you than seven sons and has given birth to him. Uh, in the ancient world, particularly in the Hebrew culture and in Scripture, seven is the number of completion or perfection. Uh, in the ancient world, we've already said this, uh, and, and no offense to the, the women in our class, but in the ancient world, what's more important, a son or a daughter? A son. Well, a son is. And so seven sons would be the ideal number. It's the number of perfection, the number of completion. To have seven sons would have been thought in that time to be the greatest blessing God could give. Except what do the women say here? Your daughter-in-law is better. Ruth, the Moabite woman, yeah. is better than seven sons. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just don't think of a higher compliment that, that anyone could give uh, to a woman in, in Israel, in, uh, in Bethlehem. Ruth has shown herself through all that she's done to be better than seven sons. And, and this daughter, remember the story here, when Naomi was coming back, what did she tell both of her daughter-in-laws? Don't come back with me. What? Go back, go, go back to your mother's house. And may you find rest there. And Ruth said, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> you know, wherever you go, I'm going. And wherever you lodge, I'm lodging. 
you know, and your God's going to be my God, and, and your people are going to be my people, and where you die, that's where I'm going to die and be buried. May the Lord do to me, and, and even worse, if, if anything separates me from you. Uh, and now Ruth, who insisted on coming back, has become uh, essentially the instrument of God's redemption for Naomi. She has provided a son, and that son has now restored fullness. Now, I said this earlier in our class, and, and obviously it's one of the interesting things about the book. The book is named Ruth. But really, who's the main character in terms of the story or the narrative? Boys. Naomi. No, Naomi. It's really Naomi. Yeah. Naomi is, is the whole situation, right? She left with her husband and two sons and became a double widow in a sense. She lost her husband and both of her sons. No possibility of hope. No opportunity for any life. She's too old to be remarried. She she can't provide for herself. She's got to depend on her daughter-in-law to go out and, and take advantage of the laws for the poor and the stranger. I mean, she could not be in a more hopeless situation at the beginning of this story, and yet God has intervened for her, and he's brought her fullness again. He's brought her back, and so we don't want to miss that. How has he brought her back? Well, he's actually done it through two people of great integrity. One of them, a very unlikely person, a Moabite woman. Who would have ever thought that she would show herself to be obedient to the covenant God made with Israel? Nobody would have expected that. And then Boaz, a man of high reputation, has taken on a responsibility that ultimately was not his responsibility, and yet he's voluntarily taken it on. And now this couple of great integrity have brought a restoration to Naomi. And notice the focus is on Naomi. Let's look at it one more time, verses 14 and 15. Blessed is the Lord who has not left you. Who's he talking about? Who's you? Naomi. That's Naomi without a redeemer today. And may his name become famous in Israel. May he also be to you. Who's that? Naomi. Naomi. Yeah, that's Naomi, a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age, clearly. One of the concerns she had, coming back too old to, to remarry, to have any hope. Uh, for your daughter-in-law, who loves you, is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Uh, all right, so now look at verse 16. It shouldn't surprise you what happens next. Who's the character in verse 16? Who's taking action? Naomi. <laughs> okay, Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. In other words, it's clear. Not only have the women said, this is all for your benefit in a sense, now she takes the child as her own almost in a sense and becomes his nurse. In other words, she's going to be like a mother to him because ultimately it's the restoration of Naomi we, we've been pursuing throughout the story. And then notice this, verse 17, the women are through. What do the women do now? And they do. <laughs> They're the ones who give him a name. This is unusual. And so they give him quite an interesting name. But look what they say in naming him. A son has been born to who? Yeah. Ah, see, not to Ruth, not to Boaz, but to Naomi. And so it's very clear here that we are getting that full circle resolution of Naomi's, uh, of her situation, of, uh, of her destitute condition when she came back now. God has taken care of her. He has looked out for her through uh, her daughter-in-law, through the, the kindness uh, and compassion of Boaz. But now, clearly, Naomi has a son. And remember, this is the reason the other redeemer wouldn't take it, because he was going to lose something in the deal. But now Boaz is willing to give this up and let this son essentially be uh, the resolution for Naomi. And so what they call him? Well, they called him Oved, which in Hebrew comes from the verb and the noun, both, that mean to serve or servant. What an appropriate name. Obed is serving Naomi by restoring her life, restoring her livelihood, restoring her husband's name and the family in Israel. Uh, whether he knew it or not, he was serving Naomi in his birth. 
Uh, what an incredible reminder that God has better plans for us than we have for ourselves. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. And he is always looking to restore and to redeem and, and to meet our needs in ways that will help us reach our fullness of blessing, because that's what God wants from the start, you know. In Genesis, the first time humans are addressed in the entire Bible, the author says, and God blessed them. That's God's plan for us. He wants to bring blessing into our lives. The women recognize it. They praise and bless the name of God because of what he's done. Naomi recognizes it. She takes the child. The women name the child a servant, and we would assume as well a servant of God. But this is where the unexpected turn comes. And it's so funny that it's not a major part of the story at all. It's sort of tagged on at the end. But it's really one of the main reasons this story survived and no doubt was put into the, the Scripture. Uh, notice verse 17 in conclusion that Oved is the father of Jesse, the father of who? David. Wow. You talk about an unexpected blessing. Now look, when, when Boaz agreed to take Ruth, could he possibly have imagined that one of his descendants was going to become the great king over the nation of Israel. No. I don't think there's any way he could have imagined that. No. Let's, let's also note this. Did Boaz take the opportunity for his own gain in the sense that his family would become famous in this way? No. No. Oh, clearly his motive has always been for the good of Naomi and Ruth. But here's the great thing about God. He gives us extra blessings. When we serve him obediently, he gives us the blessing of service and the opportunity to make an impact on people's lives. But then he goes one step further, and he gives us blessings that we couldn't even imagine. I'll put it in this way. Are you looking forward to the kingdom of God? Yes. yes. <laughs> I am. Would you say that the kingdom of God in itself is a blessing to us? Yes. yes. It is, but let's not forget something that Pastor Ron talked about in the revival, and that is we're going to get rewards. As if the kingdom of God was not a great enough reward for us, God is going to reward us for our faithfulness. And here's the ultimate reward. You're going to love this. In Revelation chapter 22, when God's new heaven and new earth has been made, when the new Jerusalem has come down, and we're back in a garden scene. It's very reminiscent of the beginning of Genesis. And, and I just want to read this here because this is ultimately where we're headed. And in many ways, this connects with the way Ruth ends with the statement of David, the great king. And so if you'll look there in Revelation 22, just for a second. Uh, notice verse 3. There will no longer be any curse. Hey, why is that? Because what did God want for humans from the start? He wanted blessing. So there's not going to be a curse anymore. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. This is interesting. What do we got at the end of Ruth? Well, we got a child named Servant, and we have a king. And here's God, the divine king and creator, and his son, the lamb, Jesus, who were there on their throne, there reigning, and his servants are serving him, verse 5, excuse me, verse 4, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will, just don't miss this now, and they will what? Right. They will reign forever and ever. You know what's interesting here? That we are going to be returned to what God created us for, which is to be the image of God, to be his servants, and those who are co-regents who reign with God over creation. That's what he set us up to be. And we rebelled against him as king, and we lost the ability to be his image. But now through Jesus, he's restored that image in us, the power of the Spirit of Christ in us, and one day, we're going to be in the kingdom of God, and we're going to join God, the great king, and Jesus, the lamb, in reigning over this renewed creation for eternity. That's a pretty good deal. What, what do you think? Yeah. 
Real good yeah. news. Amen. <laughs> God is giving us a blessing we couldn't even conceive, and honestly, we still can't fully understand it, even though we see it promised here. All right, so back to Ruth. But you know what? It would be pretty good just to end the story right there, that Obed is the father of Jesse and Jesse the father of David, which would have at least told us where this story was headed. But that's not where it ends. Now, there are some scholars who suggest that it should end there, and that this little genealogy that's put on the end was a later addition to the book. I'm not convinced of that. I think it's integral to the story, and I'll give you two reasons why. First of all, notice how verse 18 begins. Now, these are the generations of Perez. Uh, this is quite interesting. We don't have time to do it, but if you were to go back to the book of Genesis, you would find the book of Genesis has this phrase repeating very often introducing genealogies and showing how God is at work through the generations of humans created in his image. So it's clear to me that the author of Ruth here has taken us back to Genesis one more time. Uh, notice Perez. Well, how does that connect? Genesis 38 and the story of Tamar. At the end of that story, she is able to conceive and she bears twins and very interesting conclusion to that story there in chapter 38, uh, verse 27. I'll just read this. You don't have to turn there. It came about at the time she, being Tamar, was giving birth, that, behold, there were twins in her womb. Moreover, it took place while she was giving birth. One put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, This one came out first. But it came about as he drew back his hand, that, behold, his brother came out, then she said, what a breach you have made for yourself. So she named him Perez, which is a breach. Afterward, his brother came out with the scarlet thread on his hand, and he was named Zerah, which means brightness. But here's the thing. Perez is through whom the lineage of Obed is traced. There's a genealogy going back to Genesis to the very story of Tamar. And remember the blessing just moments ago in chapter 4, that uh, Ruth would be like Leah and Rachel that built the house of Israel, but also like Tamar. Right. So it is no accident that the author has given us a genealogy that starts right there with Tamar and traces on down. And then you got a bunch of unpronounceable names, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, but then we trace officially down to David. And, and, of course, what is the point of that? Well, it doesn't have to tell us who David is, because when this story was written, everybody understood. But can we tie back in one more time? Uh, what's on the, the front end of the book of Ruth? In those days, what were those days? The days of the judges. 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 And what was the ending of Judges that set up the story? In those days of Judges, there was no king, king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes, and Elimelech's name was, my God is king. king yeah. And now the story ends with kingship again. It ends with David, who is a descendant of Tamar, a Canaanite woman who was brought into the family of God by God's sovereignty, and now a Moabite woman who was brought into the family of God is going to bear Obed, who will be the father of Jesse, who will be father of David, the great king, who will bring uh, the blessing uh, of God's Messiah to bear, the, the anointed one, uh, into the whole story. I mean, I, I just, as I think about this, I stand in amazement. Could Ruth and Boaz have imagined all that was coming for them as a result of what God was doing? No. It's amazing. Hey, you know what, though? We're not done. Turn to Matthew chapter 1 real quick. You see, I'm an Old Testament guy. And I especially appreciate how the New Testament starts. Anybody want to take a look there? Verse 1, what is it? It's the record of the genealogy. It's actually the same phrase that's used in Genesis chapter 5, the book of of the generations, chapter 5, verse 1, similar phrase to the phrase in Ruth 4.18.
So what better way to start the New Testament than to start with a genealogy that connects us back to the entire story of the Old Testament? In case you were wondering, this isn't really a New Testament, is it? It's just a continuation of what God was already doing. Now, there's a new covenant, but it's a covenant that, that's not new in the sense that God had not anticipated and prepared for it. All right, now, here's my favorite part of this genealogy. Notice next, the record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, so that's the king, the anointed one, the son of David, there's our connection back to the story of Ruth, and the son of Abraham, which takes us all the way back to Genesis. Mm -hmm. So just in that phrase, we've tied Jesus back to this entire scenario. Now we're going to work it out in particular. Can I highlight four women real quick? Verse 3. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, the Canaanite woman that God graciously brought in to the genealogy. Verse 5, Solomon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. Huh. Who's Rahab? Prostitute. The prostitute from Jericho, a Canaanite woman who was brought into the lineage of the great king by her faith. Boaz was the father of Oved by Ruth, Ruth, the Moabite woman who was brought into the lineage of the great king by the grace of God. Uh, The father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David the king. David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba, who had been the wife of Uriah. And you may or may not have connected this before, but if she's the wife of Uriah, anybody remember in the Old Testament, how is Uriah described? What's kind of almost a part of his name? Uriah the Hittite. Yeah, Yeah, that's right. So what does that likely indicate about Bathsheba? She's a Gentile. She's a Hittite woman. Not to mention the fact that, sadly, she's an adulteress. And the author of Matthew even makes it more pointed. In our translation, we're actually supplying her name. In Hebrew, uh, excuse me, in Greek, in chapter 1 of Matthew, Matthew doesn't supply her name. He just calls her the wife of Uriah, Mm -hmm. which is quite interesting. Here's my point, though. We've got four foreign women in Matthew 1. Would you have expected the God of Israel, if, by the way, his only concern was for the purity of the genealogy of Abraham, that he would have included four foreign women in the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah? No. And here's why. you got to love this. Abraham was a Gentile when God called him. He wasn't a Jew. The category of Jew didn't exist. He was simply a man living in Mesopotamia who worshipped other gods, who obeyed the, the God of creation when he called him, and he gave him the sign of circumcision, and he gave him the, the blessing of being the one who would begin this line. But here's the thing. In the promises to Abraham, this is what we end with today, back in Genesis 12, since the author of Ruth has taken us back to Genesis in this genealogy, let's just go back in chapter 12 where God calls Abram and makes a covenant with him. And notice what he says. He says, I'm going to bless you. Mm-hmm. By the way, would you say God has blessed Boaz and Ruth and Naomi in this story? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you're going to be a blessing. Would you say in this story that Ruth and Boaz have been a blessing? Yes. And then thirdly, he says to Abraham, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And you know what? Here it is. Jesus the Messiah has four foreign women in his genealogy, because what has God been thinking about all along? Not just saving Israel, not just saving the Jews, not just saving the elect. What's he been thinking about all along? Using Israel as a light to the nations so that the Gentiles could come in. Now, see, you ought to get excited about that, because unless I don't know something about you guys, all of you are Gentiles along with me. (laughs) 
<laughs> bunch of uncircumcised Gentiles. <laughs> but what did God do? He included us. He brought us in. Yep. He, he included us. And it happened in an unlikely way. David's grandmother was a Moabite woman. And by the way, I think this is interesting. We'll end with this thought today. Do you think ethnically and in the time, in light of the way Moab was portrayed as an enemy, as a, an incestuous people, uh, perverted, and, and all the terrible things we said about them on the front, do you think typically somebody would want others to know that they had a Moabite in their lineage? No. <laughs> But now here's the thing. Why would David be proud to call Ruth his grandmother? Because she was a woman of character and of great faith. And so here's, here's the point. Ethnicity and all of those things that we get caught up in, God's not concerned about at all. He's concerned with people who will follow him in obedience and who will live by faith and will do his will. Did Ruth qualify in that category? Yes. Man. And so we got a great example in Ruth for the rest of us Gentiles. Let's live in a way that honors God, that allows his purposes to go forward in our lives, and who knows what kind of incredible blessing we'll experience just by following God and doing what he's asked us to do. Well, that's going to be our conclusion to Ruth. I hope the study has made an impact on you over these several weeks. And I pray that you'll remember what we've learned and that you'll apply those things as you seek to follow the Lord faithfully in the ways that Ruth and Boaz did. Uh, let's conclude with prayer. Father, we give you thanks for this day, Lord. Thank you for the study we've been able to do in the book of Ruth, for the previous study in the book of James, Lord. God, I pray that we'll see continuing fruit in our lives as a result of your word. God, we thank you that the author of Hebrews says your word is like a two-edged sword that pierces to the dividing of bone from marrow. It, it reveals the thoughts and intents of the heart. And God, I pray that as we've studied your word, Lord, we have felt your spirit piercing our own hearts, God, as we've seen ways in which we have failed to be uh, obedient to you, Fa ways in which we have failed to take advantage of the opportunities you give us to be a blessing to others, Lord. But God, we thank you that you're willing to include us, God, in this great story, this great plan of redemption. And Lord, we thank you that as a result of what Christ has done, we have been adopted into the family of God. We've been grafted into the olive tree of Israel. And Lord, you're going to give us rewards, even though, God, we, we've not deserved what you've given. Lord, you're going to give us rewards in the kingdom of God. And so we praise you for your abundant grace, for your, your covenant faithfulness, your chesed, and, Lord, I pray that we will live in light of these truths, even when we face the difficulties of life, that we'll come to you with our complaints like Naomi did, that we'll look to you to be our kinsman redeemer. And, Lord, that we'll allow you to work in our lives in such a way that we might be able to spread your wing over others who are in need, just as Boaz spread his garment over Ruth, Lord. Thank you for the way this story ministers to us and encourages us and challenges us, Lord. Help us to continue to serve you no matter what, what may come. Bless us now and help us as we go forward. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jeff. Thank, Thank you, Jeff. It was a good study. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Amen. And we did it just in time for the Brookells to go to Florida. So it must have been God's providence. <laughs> watch you down there on zoom we were looking forward to it. <laughs> that's true uh, you know. uh, all right well i've enjoyed it uh, at this point you know we'll go back to our regular class on campus at clearview uh and mark will be teaching for the foreseeable future but uh, even though i won't get to see you guys keep praying for me at cedar springs as i try to serve that church faithfully and, and help them navigate this difficult time and help them find a pastor that can lead them forward You've all been a blessing to me, and I look forward to seeing you back in class uh, on Clearview's campus in the days to come. Thank you, Jeff. Thank Thanks. You. Well, Peggy. Well, Peggy. It will. Bye -bye. It will. <laughs> it will. Right. We'll see you. Thank you. Bye. I'll be with you. Bye. All right, Pat. You guys have a good trip to Florida next Thank week. Thank you. Thank you. Be safe. We'll miss you all. Miss you, too. Yeah. Miss you. But we'll be back. <laughs> All right, good deal.
Sorry, all right. Bye-bye. There's two of us still here.